Welcome back. Last week, I reviewed a book called La Disparition uh, by Georges Pirec, which translates into English as A Void. And this book was super unusual for a very simple reason, uh, which was that for 300 plus pages of this novel, the letter E was not used once. And I, that was a super interesting literary challenge for the author, of course, uh, and, and I found for the reader, uh, because it, the syntax that develops out of this writing constraint is a little bit stilted, a little bit difficult. I found, and I said this in my review, that the author was sort of showing off a little bit his ability to source words that were without the letter E. And so what could have been a fun experiment uh, and should have been a short experiment turned into a pretty long and tedious exercise. And quite honestly, I was pretty happy when I finished it and, and I gave it a pretty poor review. But I did get kind of interested in what were the origins of this book and of this style and, and what this author was trying to do. And I think it's always very interesting to try and uh, do a deep dive in experimental writing. I always really respect when authors try new things, try to develop new techniques. And I felt that this guy was really trying to do something different. So I investigated it a little bit and I wanted to share today in this long video, which you're absolutely free to stop watching, uh, what were some of the origin points of that book, of the movement behind the book? What were some other experimental writing movements that were developed alongside this? And finally, I wanted to conclude with some recommendations on really fun experimental books that you might want to read and that I could recommend if you were interested in reading stuff that was a little bit more innovative and out there. So we'll start at the beginning. This book, La Disparition, which was translated as A Void, uh, was written by this author, Georges Pirec, and he was a member of a literary movement called ULIPO, which is an acronym of sorts, a French acronym for the words Ouvroir de la littérature potentielle which translates roughly as a workshop for uh, potential literature. Uh, so everything is said there. We're, we're looking at a group that is uh, very much uh, experimental and looking at the potential avenues to explore in literature. So this movement was founded in 1960 by a French poet called Raymond Queneau. And he was a very experimental poet and writer uh, who was originally affiliated with the Surrealist movement, the art movement, uh, but he broke off with them over political questions of whether they were too communist or too supportive of the Soviet Union while he wasn't. So he sort of split off and did his own thing and eventually founded this, this movement, ULIPO, the workshop for potential literature. And he was really interested in working with other writers in this workshop to develop literature that was going to be constrained. And the key thing to understand here is that they were trying to constrain literature in order to make it generate results that may be, yes, completely absurd, but also might generate some interesting avenues for exploration. And so by constrained writing, the most prominent example would be uh, what is called a lipogram, which is exactly what this novel, La Disparition, is. A lipogram is a piece of literary work where uh, a certain letter or a number of letters are excluded. So in this case of La Disparition, it was the letter E. Uh, obviously, that's super challenging if you stop for two seconds to think how often the letter E uh, occurs in the French language and the English language. It's in fact the most common letter used in both languages. So it's hugely challenging to write a book that doesn't contain that letter. So that's the kind of constraint that uh, they were interested in exploring. There are lots of other constraints uh, that they were interested in exploring. For example, palindromes. Uh, now, a palindrome is a piece of writing again, 
where the letters are symmetrical. So one of the most famous ones in the English language is able was I, ere I saw Elba. And if you look at the letters on either extremity of the sentence and you work your way inside, you'll see that the, the phrase is a mirror with a center at the middle of the phrase, which reflects every single letter. Uh, and so in fact, uh, Georges Perec, the writer of La Disparition, is known for writing one of the longest palindromes in the French language, which I think is something like 1300 words or something absurd like that. Uh, so 1300 words where the letters uh, are focused on a single, uh, on a single focal point in the middle. Uh, and obviously, if you read that passage, which I have, it's completely nonsensical and absurd, but he has found words that are completely mirrored and symmetrical. There are other uh, constraints that are completely insane. Uh, another is called the knight's move, okay? So this was one of Ulipo's uh, great inventions, the knight's move, uh, which is to focus on the action and if you imagine the action space to be like a chessboard, the action can only move like a knight in chess. And so one of the big examples of knight's move in literature is another work by Georges Perec, which was called La Vie Mode d'Emploi. In English, it was called Life, a user's manual. And it, it was about a building with multiple different apartments in it. And if you follow the action of where stuff is happening in the building, you'll see that Perec is employing a knight's move throughout the book. And that is a constraint that forces him to, to, to look at the action and a plot development in a certain location that he has preset. Uh, so that's another insane Lipo development. There's another really funny one called, uh, in English, Pilish, where you take the number pi, 3.14, blah, 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 and you write a text in which each of the words has the same number of letters as the decimals in pi. So your first word would have three letters, your second word would have one letter, your third word would have uh, four letters. Uh, there's another one called S plus seven, where you take a certain text and every single noun or name, you look in the dictionary and you go down the dictionary to the next noun, seven nouns down, and you replace that noun with the noun seven nouns down. So eventually it gives something completely nonsensical. Uh, and you can see how Raymond Queneau's origins, the founder's origins with the surrealists sort of reflect back to this kind of crazy innovative literature uh, that generates often uh, something that's akin to gibberish. So there were a number of writers who were part of this movement, Ulipo. There was obviously its founder, Raymond Queneau. There was obviously Georges Perec, who was one of its most prolific uh, writers. And he sadly died quite young, I think in the early 80s. And then there are other authors that were maybe more or less honorary members, like, for example, uh, Italo Calvino, the Italian uh, writer uh, who was a postmodern metafictional writer uh, who did like to dabble in borderline absurdist literature uh, and certainly metafictional literature. So his penultimate novel was called uh, If on a Winter's Night a Traveler, which is all written in the second person. And the hero, the protagonist of the book is in fact the second person, i.e. you, you are the hero of this book. And so it's all about you picking up the book and reading the book and so on. So there was that level of experimentation. And then Ulipo is, is still, in fact, uh, still alive and well, despite having been founded in the 1960s. It got a real uh, boost a couple of years ago when one of its members, the French novelist Hervé Letellier, won the Prix Goncourt, which, was, which is the most prestigious uh, literary prize in France for the best novel of the year. And he won the uh, prize for a novel called L'Anomalie, which has been translated into English as The Anomaly. And this book became a super duper bestseller, mostly because the author made the choice of 
writing it in a very trashy, popular style that was very reminiscent of a cheap American TV series that you might find on Netflix. So he, he sort of made the bet that he could write a book in that style. And because the style was kind of trashy and very accessible, it became a very big be bestseller in France. Um, and I absolutely hated it. I really don't recommend it. I find it, I found it really cheap and, and sort of easy and banal. A lot of people absolutely loved it. So who am I to say, uh, but just not my cup of tea. But anyway, he really um, gave the group Lipo a big boost of visibility. He's in fact, the president of this group today. So the group is alive and well. Uh, it's a bit of an archaic group still because it's got a bit of a dodgy attitude towards accepting women. Uh, so the first woman was accepted in the group like in the 80s or something. It's a little bit retrograde and it's not clear that they've become a little bit more open-minded lately. Um, but who knows? Uh, so Ulipo is one thing and it's, it's a very visible uh, literary experimental group. And I talk about it only because I reviewed one of their books last week, uh, but there are lots of other avenues for experimental and innovative writing. They're not the only group. So I thought I'd spend a few minutes looking at a quick, broad overview, nothing too deep, on what were some of the paths of experimentation and innovation in literature. I think one of the earliest examples of a very experimental, innovative novel is uh, one from the 18th century called The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman by Lauren Stern. Uh, and this is very experimental for the simple reason that it's a memoir of this fictitious character, uh, Tristram Shandy, who's this English minor aristocrat who proceeds to tell his story, but the joke is that he's incapable of telling his story because he always goes on these crazy digressions. And anytime he even touches a subject, he goes off in another direction. So the writer, Lawrence Stern, was really experimenting with uh, the malleability of a plot and how you could really send it in any direction you wanted. And he really made the reader zig and zag all over the place. And that was part of the joke. The, the, the joke is ultimately that in this book uh, of Tristram Shandy, nothing happens. Of course, then you can look at that book and it goes, you, you can see how it influenced a whole branch of literature. If you look at American postmodern literature today, for example, the big authors like David Foster Wallace, Don DeLillo, Thomas Pynchon, they too have a habit of going into uh, certain digressions, of telling side stories about side characters to add a little bit of context or layering. And they do that very well. And that all comes from that innovation of Lawrence Stern in the 18th century. Uh, so David Foster Wallace, his masterpiece called Infinite Jest, which he wrote in 1996, is full of digressions and footnotes, footnotes that he even said were completely irrelevant to the plot. And so he has that debt of gratitude to a writer who was, uh, you know, 300 years before him, uh, experimenting with that style. So then if you fast forward a little bit in experimental literature, uh, I would say that really it's at the beginning of the, ninth, of the uh, 20th century, let's say the first couple of decades of the 20th century, and especially with the start of the First World War, that stuff starts getting really experimental, not just in fiction, but also in poetry. And so you've got poets like W.B. Yeats, uh, starting to experiment with form and structure and breaking rules that were considered to be sacrosanct beforehand. You had to have a certain number of beats in the rhythm and the iambic pentameter and all that jazz. And for the first time, poets started saying, wait a minute, what if I just wanted to focus on emotions and feelings uh, and how could I bring that up? in a way that's not linked to rhythm and beats and so on, but maybe more linked to 
imagery, visual references, and so on. And so eventually uh, that uh, closely followed up with big poets like uh, Ezra Pound, who wrote his cantos, but especially the great popularizer of modernist poetry, my favorite poet of all time, T.S. Eliot, who is just a uh, creator of so many different visual references. And you think to yourself, well, if you read T.S. Eliot, you think, well, poetry was always kind of like that, wasn't it? But he really invented a lot of it and made it okay to write poetry that didn't necessarily rhyme, didn't necessarily have the right number of beats in it, didn't necessarily follow the rules that had been established by ancient, ancient poets. He really reinvented a lot of it. Uh, but at the same time, in this, in this time around, just before, during, and after the First World War, which had completely shocked societies and artists because of its violence and its brutality and it, 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 the, the taking of violence to the very next level with trench warfare, total war, etc. Uh, this had shocked societies and artists into, into thinking of new ways, tapping into their feelings and emotions. So closely associated with the modernist movement in literature, obviously was uh, James Joyce. I mean, he's one of the most innovative, experimental writers in the world. And with James Joyce, what you think is experimental means scary. And you're not far wrong because Joyce is admittedly difficult to read. And his magnum opus, uh, the novel Ulysses, is, you know, it's this thick. It's really difficult to go through. People are terrified to read it. I've read Ulysses. It's not an easy read, but it is a great read. And I think... You've got to approach it in a very, I'm gonna sound a bit cheesy here. Uh, I'm gonna sound like a bit of a douche, but I'm gonna say it anyway. You've got to approach it a bit with a meditative state and you gotta let yourself flow. And you've just gotta read it and stop worrying about whether you've got this reference or that reference. Obviously, there are resources you can use to research the book a little bit before, during, and after having read it to understand some of the hidden meaning, but you shouldn't weigh yourself down too much with obsessing with interpreting every single reference and every single allegory in there. Just read it and try and connect to uh, some of the emotion and some of the mastery of language that James Joyce puts forward. That's one way of looking at James Joyce. The same cannot be said with his final novel called Finnegan's Wake, which is widely considered to be one of the most difficult, incomprehensible, impenetrable books uh, in Western literature. Very, very difficult. I've never read it. I don't have the courage to do it. One day I will, probably on my deathbed, uh, but it is considered very difficult. You're not supposed to understand anything about the plot. Is there a plot? Who cares? Who knows? who the characters are, what they're doing, what their motivations are. It's sort of irrelevant. It's all in the name of experimentation and jumbling things up and seeing what works and what doesn't work. If you read that and you think you've understood it, please give me a call uh, because I would love to know uh, how to approach that beast of a novel. Did he create somewhere Maybe not a certain style to be emulated, but uh, certainly the possibility of breaking the rules, of smashing some of the walls of literature and saying to writers, hey, you can try anything uh, and you can experiment with anything. And, and therefore that opened up the path to uh, a whole host of writers, uh, not least of which uh, was his editorial assistant, a young playwright by the name of Samuel Beckett who became hugely influential with his experimental theater. Obviously, we have to talk about uh, William Faulkner in the US. He was certainly uh, a major groundbreaker in the fiction that he was developing. Uh, and when I say groundbreaker and innovative with regard to William Faulkner, I mean, yeah, Faulkner's very difficult to read. It's not easy. He was writing in the 30s and 40s and really toying with uh, structure, with narrative techniques uh, that were completely new. 
and, and that were often quite frightening to readers in the United States where he was from. He was from the Deep South, from the state of Mississippi. Uh, and the stuff he wrote in America, they were like, what's this dude doing? This is really quite scary. And it was only actually in Europe and specifically in France that Faulkner first got the recognition that he deserved as a real pioneer in a lot of storytelling techniques uh, that were very confusing for readers when they were first coming out. And I've only read two Faulkner books, both of which were incredibly difficult. Really, they, they give nothing away. Uh, and you are uh, reading this and thinking, what is happening? I don't understand which character is which. And for example, As I Lay Dying, uh, one of the books of his that I've read, uh, is told from the point of view of multiple different characters, all of whom are speaking in a sort of Southern vernacular, uh, in quite cryptic ways. You're not sure who is dying at what stage, and, and the pieces fall bit by bit, and you're able to reconstruct the story and the plot and what's going on. It turns into this crazy odyssey. Uh, the other book I've read by him is Absalom, Absalom, uh, which is very tough to get into. Uh, again, Faulkner gives nothing away and he's playing around with language and time and emotion and characterization. And, and so some characters who appear in a certain light at some points in the book later appear in a completely different light. So uh, you really have to buckle up your seatbelt, get in for the ride. And if you can make it till the end, then you are very richly rewarded because uh, the books evoke themes of land and history and slavery and family and it's just extremely painful traumatic stuff uh that he brings up in ways that are uh really unique even to this day uh i, I think he really still has an influence on a lot of writers in, in the way that he was uh putting together his narrative storytelling and it's really uh, absolutely unique. So then there are lots of other forms of experimental writing. You can go in all sorts of crazy directions. There's a thing called uh, asemic writing, which is where writing is not actually writing, where it's just meaningless squiggles. Uh, and that had some involvement from uh, artists. And there you get into a sense where really surrealist artists and uh, these writers, these experimental writers were converging to this kind of stuff. I mean, you're, you're no longer really in literature, you're more in the domain of art. Uh, but there's other things like the anti-novel, uh, which can also be equated to another French experimental movement called Le Nouveau Roman, uh, the new novel, which was championed in the 40s, 50s, 60s. It was sort of a literary equivalent to the French New Wave, uh, the, the film movement that revolutionized cinema in the 50s and 60s. Uh, so the French New Novel uh, was developed by authors like Claude Simon uh, and Alain Robbe-Grier. So these are big names in French literature. Uh, you've also got Marguerite Duras, who wrote a very powerful, uh, who wrote a lot of very powerful novels, but one of her main, most accessible novels is probably The Lover, uh, which she wrote in 1985 and for which she won the Prix Goncourt in France. Um, and, and that was experimental in the sense of the structure of the novel, which was a, a vague autobiography of her uh, youth uh, in French Indochina. Alain Robbe-Grier, he also connected, like I just said, with the French New Wave cinema because he co-wrote the screenplay for uh, the famous French movie last year in Marienbad, which is considered a really experimental, borderline nonsensical French movie of that era. So there the connection was more with the burgeoning form of cinema. So th these are some of the directions that literature could take. Uh, there's obviously a lot of experimental literature, uh, a lot of movements going on today. And I think the latest news that we're getting right now with artificial intelligence and uh, the software ChatGPT, which is an AI software which 
can write all sorts of forms, not least of which fiction or poetry or songs, uh, and be virtually indistinguishable from uh, human writing, that's happening right now. And so there's a real possibility that fiction as we know it is gonna be written by artificial intelligence, by robots who may be able to write literature that is not even about emotion or feelings, but about a completely different element of existence. These things are gonna have IQs of 12,000, so we can't, you know, even fathom what these forms are, are, are gonna look like. It's gonna be completely crazy. I have a feeling we're gonna be seeing a lot of uh, chat GPT fiction coming out quite soon, and I have a feeling a lot of it is gonna be actually very readable and enjoyable and certainly entertaining, maybe less capable in terms of uh, layering stories with allegory and finding depth in characters, but who knows, we'll see, we'll see where that evolves. I would love to end this with some suggestions on some really fantastic works of experimental literature that you could enjoy, works that are, yes, experimental, but also accessible, uh, and I have three recommendations here. My first recommendation is one of my favorite books of all time, which is a novel called Christy Mallory's Own Double Entry by B.S. Johnson, who is really writing anarchist fiction uh, about a man's view of society and his place in that society uh, that just starts sliding into complete chaos and anarchy uh, and I just really loved it because it's so, uh, it's so crazy, but I think it's uh, a very accessible uh, piece of literature that is funny, even though it's quite dark, uh, and you should certainly be able to identify some elements of experimental innovative fiction in that book. I'm also gonna include a book that was quite recent maybe not so experimental uh, and definitely accessible, uh, but certainly very powerful. And that is the book Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo. You'll see that the prose is in fact a mix of prose and verse almost. There's little punctuation. It flows in a pretty unique way. But again, it's not, not disorienting. You're always in good hands, it's flowing in, in a good way. Uh, it explores themes of gender, race, struggles for along both of those issues in uh, contemporary Britain, but also Britain back in the 50s. Uh, and there are some incredible arcs that are part of a, a quite fun structure that is presented uh, in the book. So. I, I, it's not as experimental as, say, a James Joyce book, but I want to include it in here because uh, it, it pushes boundaries in various ways, and I think it's, in any case, a fantastic book to read, and it'll give people a taste of what experimental fiction might look like. And if you're in the mood for some really heavy lifting, I've just given you two pretty accessible books, which are definitely very readable and easy to enjoy. If you're looking for something a little bit edgier, more experimental, heavier lifting, but ultimately also very rewarding, then I would suggest a book called Conversation in the Cathedral by Mario Vargas Llosa, who is a Peruvian novelist, winner of the Nobel Prize. And he published it in 1969. And it is, um, really very difficult, uh, i.e. you've got multiple storylines interweaving with each other. You've got dialogue occurring between two different sets of protagonists in different places, often in different eras, and you're supposed to decode uh, what is uh, happening. Uh, and, uh, but nonetheless, the book is done in a way that if you really start paying attention, you really dive in, gradually it all starts to make sense. And once you follow that construction, and you have to do a lot of heavy lifting, this is not an easy book, this is for like, you know, uh, you know, high level readers. 
but if you follow the construction, you follow the way it's done, you get to some amazing situations that the author has elaborated where, for example, at one point in the story, one character is telling another character about the death of the other character's father, but neither of them really knows that they are talking about this character. And, and it's really incredibly well put together how the convergence of that dialogue, of all that structure is put together. It's, but again, uh, you know, enter at your peril. This is really for heavy, heavy readers. Uh, if you're looking to dip your toes in something a little easier, then the first two books I've mentioned are probably uh, better starting points. And that was it for today for my talk about uh, Ulipo, the French experimental literary movement, and the various other experimental movements that uh, arose around it, before it, during its time, after its time, and so on. So I hope you found this interesting. If you did, please don't forget to subscribe. Uh, I try and have new content here, uh, both from uh, my podcast, but also standalone videos uh, on a regular basis. Please uh, subscribe, tell your friends and family, and I'd love to hear from any of you if you have any comments or questions around stuff that you've read today. Thanks a lot. Bye.